how things are going around in our world, we know that we're pretty much doomed. All right, it's, it's, not a, it's a no-brainer. The Rasmussen poll, if you looked at it, a uh, majority yeah. of the people in America have disapproved our current president yeah. uh, because they can tell that he's not in there. It's pretty <laughs> obvious. Uh, all you have to do is just simp uh, it's all over the internet. Anyone can find it easily of uh, Biden's gaffes or Biden's mistakes. There's just too many. The one example where after he was uh, done proclaiming, I'm a professor, you know, I've been a professor at UPenn or something like that. Then when he was done with the speech, turned around to shake somebody's hand and nobody was there. And then he just stood still and then went like this, you know, and then he started to walk off. So you can tell he's getting up in years. So, so it's, uh, we're, we're toast, okay? That's why the other, the other foreign nations are getting more bold because the reason why everyone kept in their place, a big core was America. But now they're getting more bold and a lot of, Chaos is happening. We see war coming out. We see a lot of opposition and a lot of problems arising. Uh, one of the funniest ones was where Biden, he was talking about uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan to one person. Oh, yeah. And then this was during Easter. And while he was talking, the Easter bunny cut in front of him and went like this. And Biden's like, hey, hey, like that. But then the Easter bunny pushed it try to move him aside and Biden just moved along because Biden was going to say something dumb and basically the person who was the Easter Bunny was one of the White House staff helpers of Biden so before he made another mistake where a bunch of people were uh, so quick to be able to catch that and expose it that's why they moved him along Another one, when he mentioned about Happy Easter, you know, I think he did a salute first, you know, <laughs> which is kind of yeah. weird. But then the wife's like, wave, wave, wave you know, yeah. wave. So then he started waving. So we can see that our days are numbered. Uh, mene, mene, tekel, you Harrison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belteshazzar would have been a better president and king <laughs> than our current one. So there's no doubt that we're toast. We can see right here that basically the reason why we ended up in this way is because of what the people argue, and in their minds, this is how they argue. It's equality, equal rights, but we can see plainly, no, this is socialism, this is communism, this is basically controlling people's lives, more government control, and when the government had more control, there's still no improvement. There's still a lot of problems more than ever before. So... Where we're heading toward and where our country is heading toward, people are upset about it and Christians as well. But you got to realize this is that you have to defend your faith. People think that in order to fight back, it's to actually just fight back against the government. But you see how well it went at January 6. It doesn't matter. We have to understand this is Satan's kingdom and dominion. What's the most important is getting the person saved. If the person Amen. gets saved... Amen and spiritually growing in the Lord, what happens is it prevents them from making a wrong decision for our country. But in order to do that, can you defend your faith? You have to do that. What's wrong with our country? I can tell you what's wrong simply through scripture, can you? I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of scriptures where you can disprove Biden's socialist America. And you're going to learn all of that. That way you can show it to your fellow people what's wrong. I'm going to show you plainly. There's too many scriptures that condemn where our country is headed toward. Well, the reason why I voted for that was because of this. The reason why I voted for this person was because of this. The reason why I, well, their beliefs, they would call it Democrat or liberalism, or they might call it social democracy, American liberalism. It doesn't matter whatever the terms they call it. But we will cover these beliefs on why they try to do it. It's because they want to try to equate the wealth and the people who are underprivileged catch up in the same equal level. Because too many of it was apparently going to whites, they see it as. So how are you going to argue? You have to argue uh, for your faith. You have to argue persuasively, not just get angry and then, you know, just throw a tantrum. You, uh, that's not going to work with these people. So how you can argue and defend it through the scripture, I'm going to give you a lot. All right, first of all, let's go to Revelation 3. And then 
I'm going to cover their arguments. You have to understand their arguments, their reasons. Once you understand that, then you can argue more successfully. Now, remember the idea with these uh, liberals is their mindset is we have to equate the wealth. By equating the wealth, then uh, everyone will be able to have a fair start. That's why they go for minorities, underprivileged. So because these people, the rich people, have more an advantage than the poor people, so because of that, that's why we need to have the poor people at an equal level or given more privilege, uh, more privilege than the rich. That way they can be able to keep up with the economy, work hard, and do stuff. Because they argue that the reason why people aren't able to work hard or to make means is because they're underprivileged because they don't have means. Now, I can understand that. If I'm going to be not a Christian, I can understand that from a humanist standpoint. There are cases where some people suffer child abuse at homes, domestic violence, uh, like really poverty-stricken situations. And because of that, they are unable, they are unable to, uh, they still struggle finding a job, they still struggle making ends meet, and I sympathize and I get all of that. But I would like to give you some very persuasive arguments, and these are going to be based from Scripture. Let's assume everyone have all the comforts at an equal level. If everyone had a comfortable living situation, does the Bible say that the tendency, if everyone had all the comforts and everyone is comfortable, no one is suffering, everyone is comfortable, the tendency is uh, more improvement, more improvement on personality character building or is it more sin? sin? More sin. Think about it. When you spoil that child more and more and more, that child just takes it for granted and then it's more of an encouragement on laziness, more encouragement on this is what I deserve mentality, so I should get this privilege. And then the third thing, it doesn't take a lot of effort on their part. But think about it. when a person is suffering, when a person is going through that stress mode, they're in conflict, fight or flight mode. So then because of that, there's an effort on their part. Now, I know that sometimes this situation can be very bad where they might practically give up. And there are people like that. But I'll give it. But I'll explain that a little bit later. The point is, it doesn't matter if everyone's comfortable. The point is, the tendency is, when you get too comfortable, you tend to sin more easily. If alcohol is so easily available, drug is so easily available, do you think people are going to be very good boys, little good boys and girls, and they're going to keep their hands off? No, when it's so easily accessible and cheap, they're going to get it. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Notice that the Bible says, God says, he's going to spew them out of his mouth because their works are just so lukewarm that it's making God sick. Look at the works of, look, uh, the key is when people fixes up morality. Because if you want equal distribution of wealth or help out poor people, a moral person, see, would help out poor people, right? So the point is morality. That's more of the issue. It's not forcing equal distribution. It's morality here. People's got to get their hearts right with God. Now look at this. Morality don't increase when you make them comfortable. Verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God wants them to repent because if they don't repent, God's going to punish them, he says. Yeah. See, that's what happens with our nation when we get so stuck in comforts. And then because of that, the tendency is more immorality. Sin grows. So it doesn't matter if you make everybody comfortable. It won't change the fact that if there is immorality there will still be detriments to our society. Doesn't change that fact. Never changes that fact. Uh, let's look at another passage here. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 
Matthew chapter 20. So I'm giving you arguments on how you can prove from the Bible, and you can even prove, uh, rationally speaking, to a liberal on why their ideology is wrong. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 20. Now this is the standard passage that you want to use against socialism is Matthew 20. It's Matthew chapter 20. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 20, and then we'll look at verse 1. Here's another thing. They would like to say that they're not communists, right? But we Christians, on the other hand, a lot of times we'll call them communists. Uh, why do we believe that these people are communists? The reason why we believe that they're communists is because communism, socialism, social democracy, American liberalism, whatever term you want to use, it doesn't change the fact they share one thing in common. What they share in common is basically taking money away by force to give it to others. It doesn't change that fact. That's why we'll accuse them of being communist. The idea is we're hitting that main point. When you take the money by force from somebody to give it to other people. Now, is that biblical? Actually, I'm going to show you something that's anti-biblical and that's even illegal anti-lawful, if there's a, such a term. It is not biblical, and it is even illegal. Look at Matthew chapter 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Okay, so here's a business owner. He's hiring workers. And when he had greed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here idle all the day? They said unto him, Because uh, no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Here's a welfare check. <laughs> Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. The solution, obviously, is giving them more work to do, okay? Not to take away money from other people, but let's keep going on. Verse 8, So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. But, and they likewise received every man a pen, penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of, of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. So when you read verse 12, it's, uh, if you study so far, this business owner... He hired these laborers, but uh, the other workers that he hired for just only one hour, he gave them an equal amount of pay compared to the work workers who got hired earlier, and he gave them the same amount of pay. Does that sound like socialism? Actually, it's not. Uh, because what you're going to find out right here is verse 13. It's more of capitalism, so to speak. It's basically the individual's right on who he pays, on how much he wants to pay them. If you look at verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. This is actually anti-socialism because in a socialist mindset, what they would want is an equal level and equal effort, right? But the idea here is, even though you might uh, try to argue for that one, this is totally anti-socialism. You can see the unfairness here. You see an unfairness right here where it's the person with an equal amount of working hours is not the same as the person who has the uh, equal, um, uh, basically the person who doesn't have the equal amount of working hours all of a sudden end up with the same equal amount of pay, right? So that sounds very unfair. That's not really socialist. That's totally unfair. Why? Because it's the right of the owner to do what he wants with his money. Now look what the Bible says. Verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee what? No wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a what? 
penny because that's the terms on what you signed up for this job. Yeah. See, so there is a voluntary action on this part. There is no force in here. Did you notice that? There's nothing mandatory or something forced right here. It's both sides who agreed to it. Take that thine is and go thy way, and I will give un, uh, unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not what? Lawful for me to do what I will with what? My own. See, but if you take what he owns and forcibly try to, well, you know, if I was the person who had the power at this passage, I would have forced this business owner, no, given an equal amount to pay this way. Hey, no, no, no. The Bible says that would be unlawful then if you do it that way. It's lawful for the person to do what he wants with his own. So you see right here that it is unlawful then if they were to force that business owner to, hey, give them this much amount. That's unlawful, according to the scripture. Yeah. To the scriptures, to the scriptures. Uh, people don't read their Bibles quite often. But uh, here's another thing to take notice in this passage. If you look at Matthew chapter 20, again, all of this was done in a voluntary manner. You see that? The business owner was free. No government, nobody was telling him what to do. The workers, no one was telling them what to do. It's something they both volunteered and agreed upon together. So notice verse 13 is powerful. It's not wrong to do that. Secondly, it's lawful to even do that. It is unlawful, though, if you force it and it is wrong if you force it. That's important to understand. So we see how the scriptures defend itself. We can also look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we'll look at verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. I'm going to give you tons of verses to be able to argue against this successfully. There's too many scriptures that fill this out. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. Verse 7. So people are going to argue uh, these three passages, and we'll look at them later. They're going to argue that, well, the Bible says that we're supposed to help the poor, support the poor. If someone cries out in need, aren't you supposed to give money to them? And yeah, let's be honest, if you do have the money and there are rich people and billionaires and elitists, including those of the Democrat Party elitists, uh -huh, who have the money, but they don't really give out and share and help out people, right? Like they should. Or, you know, Matthew 20 is the solution. Matthew 20, not a handout, give that person a job. The solution here is not uh, uh, grabbing money. That's what a lazy person would like to do. You don't want to put in the effort by helping that person's life be changed by giving that person a job. Ha, ah, how about that? Give that person a job and that person's morality level will go up where they're going to be a hard worker and at the same time you care about that person and give them something permanent, not something temporary in life. In their life, this money runs out quickly. But then if you give them a job, that's something where they can keep going on. They can have a foothold on something. They can have a resume or something in the future. Amen. That's so important. Amen. And not only that, when God says that when you support the people, God didn't want mandatory or someone forcing them to do that. A pastor, when he preaches, you're supposed to help out the poor people and preaches on that. He doesn't uh, force them or, give, uh, or find them for doing that or have IRS or uh, the police or these kind of people force it down on you. No, what they do is that they preach. They, tell, uh, they talk about helping out people, being charitable. They don't force it. So God does the same thing. 2 Corinthians 9.7 Look at right here. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly or of what? Necessity for God loveth the cheerful giver. God does not want a person to give out money 
to help somebody when they think, oh, it's necessary. See, well, this is the, for the necessary good of everyone. No, God don't even want that. He wants a person's heart in it. Right. You might say, why is that? When a person's heart is in something, that helping the poor person lasts for a lifetime. That means more, not just Amen. passing the buck and then just shirking off responsibility. Amen. If there's a heart in there, that person's going to continue that support. Amen. See that? That's the idea that people do not understand. There is a support. So this is individual voluntary actions. This is not collective force. See, that's what the, uh, the nation is doing. They're doing a collective force. It's not an individual voluntary action on a person's part. Yeah. Uh, we're going to look at uh, another passage that would point these out. But let's look at their proof text. First of all, Mark 14. Uh, well, let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 23. Let's look at these three passages. Go to these three passages. Deuteronomy 23, Acts 4, and Matthew 19. Deuteronomy 23, Acts 4, Acts 4, and Matthew 19, Matthew 19. If we look at these three passages, this is the favorite proof text of liberals, and even Jesuits have used this as their practice code, actually. They used Acts 4. Carl, I think the Marxist, even Karl Marx himself, li liked to use this passage, or one of those famous socialists. So this is the favorite proof text of socialism. Let's look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 34. Acts chapter 4, verse 34. Notice that the passage reads right here. So Acts 4, Matthew 19, and Deuteronomy 23. Let's start off with Acts 4, 34. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So notice right here that the, if you're a good Christian, you'd give up what you own and give it to people who are in need. Well, guess what? There was no fining here. There was no government force. There was no collective force. It's what? People's hearts were in it. The people's hearts were in it at Acts 4, 34 to 35. That's why they're able to give. Hey, uh, let, me give you, uh, let me give you an example, okay? Uh, there's a lot of Christians who don't believe in socialism. They believe individual, uh, like they believe in capitalism. But these same Christians are the ones, and it's strange to me, why is it mostly... Christian organizations who are the ones who start like uh, nursing home ministries or uh, the soup lines or Salvation Army. You ever thought about that? Yeah. Wow. You know why? Because these people aren't the ones who are trying to be paid for doing it. This was voluntary compared to the quacks that we get who are getting paid for their effort give more money so that we can give it to the underprivileged, but they themselves hoard it for themselves. Very trustworthy people. See, that's a system. People don't work well in a system. Do you understand that? If you build it up as a system or a machine, people won't be able to put in a lot of good effort there. But if you do it as a voluntary manner, that's totally different. And you don't force it on the person's throat, the person will be able to do it more. It's like... Uh, Today, you hear the liberal world talking about that you can't force your kids. You can't force your kids, right? If you love them, you won't force your kids. The kid will uh, do better if the kid's heart is in it, right? That's why they do motivation tactics, right? Why, if our government really loves its children so much, why don't they follow the same thing? I think they want something. See, that's crooked. All right. We're going to look at uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 23, 24. Deuteronomy 23, 24. So notice the two answers are it's either going to be voluntary or it's going to be Old Testament. Simple. We're not in Old Testament. We're in New Testament. 
So this doesn't apply to us. Deuteronomy 23, 24. When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat grapes thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. So notice right here that this person is sharing some food of his or her own property with someone who is in need. But the simple answer is that's Old Testament. Well, we should do that too. Then stone a person to death for taking God's name in vain. You bunch of hypocrites, you. See, you just pick and choose. All right, go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Silly, silly world we live in. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. You know how silly our world is? It's so silly and its IQ level is incredibly low that you got PhD people voting for a person whose IQ is like, this is the guy that will save our nation. That's how low the PhD IQ level got with our nation. Matthew 19, 21. The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. So Jesus, see, told this rich person to give to poor people. Okay, but uh, notice this is voluntary. Verse 22 and 23 Jesus didn't say, hey, come back here. I'm going to call the IRS on you. I'm going to tattletale on you on the IRS. They didn't do that, like these silly bozos that you get nowadays. I'm going to tattletale on you, and I'm going to cry out to CNN on you, and put the Yelp thing and rat on YouTube on you, and Google, and Facebook, and Twitter. You know, that's how these silly people are. Silly, silly people. So notice it's all voluntary, individual effort. All right, go to Mark 14, Mark 14. Here's another thing that people do not understand. Okay, so then you want to distribute the wealth equally, but who's the guy in charge that's doing that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> silly, silly people. These people think that, oh, you know, when I uh, vote for this person or I help out this person, they would never... They would never abuse their power. Come on, man. How many, um, let me ask you this question, okay? Uh, if the whole church, this is an easy scenario. If the whole church gave me a whole bunch of money, okay, your offering went to me. I was the one counting all the money. I was the one holding the money. I'm the one in charge of the money. So I can make sure that all the church people have an equal distribution of wealth. And let's say that... Uh, Pastors like me have been caught with money fraud and stealing before. Then after that, would you keep trusting pastors and say, no, 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 we'll just give the money to them and let them have no accountability, no scrutiny, and let them, to, let them divide the wealth and et cetera? Would you do that? No. So then if you can do that, if you understand that with pastors, I don't know why you don't do that with your... Oh, government leaders are an exception because they're more holy than pastors because they sin less than pastors. They're more spiritual than pastors. You're cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You see how mad our world is? They have no common sense whatsoever. Look at Mark 14. Mark 14. You uh, have a very, very gullible mindset to think that, no, there won't be anything bad that happens no, look at Mark chapter 14. Mark 14. A lot of people are frustrated with where we ended up with today. So then you still didn't learn your lesson. You still trust. You still trust the leaders. Look at Mark chapter 14. Look at this. We look at verse 4. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was uh, this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have given to the poor. And they murmured against her. Oh, okay. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew. Uh, we're going to look at John 12. John 12. Same story. John 12. Same story. Uh, John 12. Same story. Look at these underprivileged. The poor. The poor. 
look at them, look at them, look at them. And at the same time, you are gullible to trust these people who say that but might want the money for themselves. Look at John 12. John 12. Read this. You know who's the one that said that? Judas Iscariot. But he started a BLM riot where he can get some people to agree with him when he was the one who held the power of the money. Oh, just like today, suckers, huh? Look at John 12, verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, right? Verse 5. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. See, people steal. You trust in man so much. I don't understand. You trust in man so much. You trust a government leader who is not saved, who is not spiritual, who is not right with the Lord, more than a spiritual uh, leader or a pastor who tries to live his or her life spiritually. Oh, but there's too many corruption. I see too many scandals. Oh, uh, government leaders so much more as well. So I don't understand. See, you, your mentality is scrambled eggs right now. Now look at Psalm 146, Psalm 146, Psalm 146. You know what Jesus answered at John 12, by the way? Jesus didn't expose Judas Iscariot corruption. Jesus said, you can't have the poor, the poor mentality. If you have that as a priority, that's not going to work. You have to have me in your heart. So that's the answer. You think that by trusting in man, that everything in society is going to turn out right? No, you can't trust in man. You forgot who you're supposed to trust to begin with. God. If you put God in your heart and your mind, won't he work out your underprivileged situation, your needs? Won't he be the one to take care of all the issues in life? And I can't tell you, look, the evidence is not just me. There are thousands of Christians, thousands of you watching right now who can testify that Yes, I am that underprivileged. I'm the one suffering. I'm the one in poverty. I can't tell you how many times God intervened for my need when my government failed to answer my phone call and try to pass me on to a different department and pass the buck. And they said one thing, we'll help you out, but they totally do another. How many Christians are a witness of that, huh? And that should speak volumes right there. Amen. Look at Psalm 146, verse 3. Psalm 146, verse 3. Put not your trust in what? Princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is what? No help. Why do you turn to them for help? That's a good verse. Psalm 146, verse 3. Your trust, you're so gullible. You're so trusting. You're so trusting that you turn to this guy. That's how desperate you were. That's how trusting you became. So much for critical thinking that higher education has strongly tried to persuade you with. They became delirious, man. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans chapter 8. Like I said, there are people, I acknowledge that, underprivileged. I acknowledge it. Rich people who don't try to help out the poor people. I acknowledge that. Why? Because everyone's a sinner. There's so much yeah. corruption. Yeah. So then, that's why it's important to understand that I can recognize the poverty-stricken situation, but man, I would like to ask you a question. I mean, why are you so desperate in your poverty-stricken situation you turn to this person rather than this person? That's my question to you. Shouldn't you just try to do what's right? Keep praying for work. Keep doing your best. Keep trusting in the Lord. Go to a Bible-believing church so that you can probably even have more resources, resources or fellow brethren to help yeah. you. Yeah. Shouldn't, you uh, shouldn't you try to help out other people who are just like you? And then maybe by that Christian deed, that person can help you in return? Amen. See? Everyone is in a me, me, me mentality while depending on this at the same time. This is an ugly cycle, guys. It's an ugly cycle that, you're in, that if you're a slave to this, this is the result that you get right here.
This is the result you get. You have to get outside of this cycle and go to here. You go here and get out of this me mentality, but think about what can I do for others? And I have to trust the Lord. And I have to think about my spiritual growth. The Lord's going to provide. Why? Because God is in control of the conditions. See, because the conditions are bad, so we fix the conditions. No, even if you fix the conditions, history has constantly proved that conditions go downhill. Always, every single time. Every single time. So then who's the God of conditions? See? Imagine the God of conditions who can even use the evil or the bad things you go through for something good. That's really a person I vote for and trust. Go to Romans 8, 28. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good. See that? God's going to work it for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God's going to work it out. Go to Philippians. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. It's God's job to supply your need. It's God's job to supply your needs. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4, and then we'll look at verse 19. But my God shall supply what? All your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You have to trust in him to be the supporter. Another one is go to 2 Thessalonians. Uh, well, actually, before I go to that other passage, I want to ask you these simple questions. We're going to go to a lot of passages. Let's go to the book of uh, Proverbs 12. Proverbs 12. We're going to look at a lot of passages in Proverbs. Proverbs. We're going to go to 19, actually. Proverbs 19. And then I want you to go back to the book of Matthew 20 again, all right? Like I told you before, go to Matthew 20 and Proverbs 19. Like I told you before, when a person is down here and then they need something, the idea is, is not to give this. This is not the solution. The solution is, this is a cuss word to some people. It's work. It's work. So, if the people are so rich and powerful, here's what I'm against them on. Why don't they give them work? Why don't they give them something to their level, something anything could do, rather than just passing by them nonchalantly and pick the workers you know, that they want. You know this guy, the boss? He just picked up anyone that he found had nothing to do. See, that's what happens. If you don't give work, what happens? The person becomes, you're going to find out in the verse, idle. He's got nothing. And then when, think about this. If you are idle, you do nothing at home, what happens? The mentality is here. Oh, yeah. Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. And yes, you are suffering, but you're not going to break free if you just keep, get stuck in there. You need to get out. That's what I'm against, this rich snobs. All right? They should have granted some people some kind of work. You know why they want to pass out money? Because some greedy people want to keep the money for themselves since they're controlling the equal distribution. Secondly, because they're lazy to help out people. They're, they themselves are lazy. If they really cared about people, give them something that can fit to them. All right? Even pick up litter on the street. Look at the, our streets, okay? You can have so many job openings or whatever, all right? But I guess there's not, not really good management of that. So the thing is, is that you got to give them something. That's why I look at Matthew 20. Look what happened here. Verse 6. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing, what? Idle. idle. And saith unto them, why stand ye here all the day idle? You know what this guy says? Because I need more money. No, because no man hath hired us. Would you say that's you? Yeah, that's, that's why you should be angry as me. Why, aren't there, why isn't there someone to give you something, right? That's what you should be angry about. 
That way you can make a life, you can make a living, you can go up on something. So then, look at that, that's the signs of the slothful. All right, so here's the thing is that, okay, I get it, people are suffering under privilege, but would you say that that's 100% of those people? That would be dangerous. Yeah. If you say every underprivileged person out there has a genuine pain and hurt, and because of that, that's why we should give them a handout and make the condition, forcibly make the conditions good. 100% of the underprivileged, you dare say that? What if I said 100% of rich people are good people? No one would go for that. I think in our world today, they think 99% of rich people are bad people and 99% of whites are bad people. That's the kind of day and age we live in, all right? This is strange world mentality, all right? Okay, so only rich people evil, poor people good? That's a twisted mentality. Let's be fair. Rich and poor have problems. Okay? So because both have problems, why don't we get the rich people to give them a job? And why don't we have the people who are underprivileged, not rich, be able to work in a job? Why don't we do it that way? Why? Because both sides have problems. Why don't we do it that way, huh? So then, let me, so then let's see, okay? Well, you know, these people are suffering. Well, the Bible says the signs of the what? Let's see if this underprivileged person has these signs. One, idleness. Do you see that? Go to Proverbs. Now, what does the Bible say right here? Chapter 19, verse 15. The Bible says, Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and a what? Idle soul, Idle soul shall suffer hunger. Do you see the person, okay? Oh, the poor state. No, 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 no. Look at the signs. Is the person idle? Is the person hungry? Let's look at another one. Look at uh, the book. Uh, look at the book of um, Proverbs twelve twenty seven. Proverbs twelve twenty seven. Proverbs twelve twenty seven. Do you see these people not putting an effort to even make food properly? No, just. Give me, right? Even anything that you give to them, anything for food, right? But what if a person cares about his or her health and they try to make an effort to make something proper? Do you see them doing that? No, because they're so stuck in this state, they'll take anything. Do you see that? They'll take anything right here. Look at Proverbs. Look at Proverbs. Chapter 12, verse 27. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. Why? Because the person is so used to being slothful that they'll take any food. They'll take anything. Does that sound hard to you? Yeah, it sounds hard to you because you're focusing on the person's poverty, underprivileged, painful situation. I get that, that there are people like that, but don't ignore the other part. Aren't there people like this who exist as well? And you when you look at these signs, signs in the Word of God, you have to ask yourself this. I think, if I see these signs, the tendency is not pain or underprivilege. It's make your beef with the Word of God. Well, you know, these people are really suffering. Then uh, I would like to ask you this. Are you out of this and doing this? If you're not and you're in this, that's why you drop into this. You don't like that, but you are. Whether you believe it or not, you have to take a good look at reality and see, oh my goodness, am I falling into here? That's how bad it is. And yeah, I feel bad for those people. That's why the solution is, I'm begging you, get out of there and go to here. All right, like I told you before, trust in the Lord, pray, Amen. do your Christian duty, and then the Lord's going to do something. Look at uh, another one. We're going to look at uh, Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18. Proverbs 18. Do you see them doing this? I don't see them usually saving money in a bank or being taking care, careful care 
of the money. It's more of once they get it, what do they do? Spend it because they want it immediately. See, they waste easily. Look at another one. The book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 9. The Bible says, He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a what? Great waster. Okay, another one. Proverbs 19, 24. Proverbs 19, 24. What is a slothful person? A slothful person is a person, you ever seen these people where uh, they, just, they just lie down on the street or sadly they took drugs and then if you want them to move out of the way, it's even painful for them to even just move out of the way. You ever met those kind of people? You know why? Look at this one. Look at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 19 verse 24. A slothful man, what? Hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. It's painful to that person to move. Well, I have a health deficit. That's why I can't do that. Well, it's because that life has been unfair to me. Well, uh, this is powerful. I'm going to show you something. Uh, you won't like this one, but this is a really good verse right here. Uh, you know, concerning about slothful people, God says that actually they would say this part. Proverbs chapter, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Let me write this down quickly. Mm. All right. We're going to look at the book of Proverbs. Uh, I thought I had the verse here, but I was wrong. Let me give me a little moment. 22:13. What's that? 22:13. Uh, let's see. Proverbs 22:13. No, no, it's 26. That's what I'm looking at. 26, 26. But that might work too. I have to read that one. <laughs> so 26:16. 2616, yes, everyone has a reason, all right? And God says, by the way, God agrees. Their reasons are very powerful. <laughs> yeah. <Wow. laughs> God says that they're very wise. God will agree, but that's a sign. You have, deep down inside your heart, you have to look at yourself. Are you stuck in this ugly cycle? If you are, then you'll find out that you did drop to this. And that's why when you drop to this, that's why anyone can pull up an excuse. Look at Proverbs 26, 16. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. That's powerful. That's powerful. I know it's powerful to believe, you know, your health, uh, your health stricken, poverty stricken. It's very powerful. But God's, but if you're truly honest with yourself, you have to ask yourself this. Am I? Look at these signs. Are, have you noticed your actions doing this? If so, are you giving a reason for all this too? Wow. Then that's dangerous. You have to admit it. You have to be honest and admit, I have this problem. You know what the society has done? Created slothfulness. Created slothfulness. And that's sad. That's pitiful. It's better if you just give them a job. And you give them a job that they're able to work in. That what they can do. Anything. Anything. That's why uh, our stupid, powerful elitists, that's what they should be doing. Instead of just passing the buck. And by the way, taxes don't even affect the top dogs. And that it has to affect the ones who are working. And those who are even poor as well. See, that's an ugly cycle. That's a trick and a deception that our current system has done. It's a beautiful deception. 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. You know what's sad? That poor people are being taxed to help out someone poorer than them. All right? No matter how much you tax, it's not going to affect the big dogs, the top elitists. What you have to do is that the top dogs and, and the rich people or anyone who has the power, give a job. Give some work. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 through 12. The Bible says, 
For even when we were with you, this commanded, this we commanded you. And let me know if I'm cut off. That if any would not work, neither should we eat, should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are what? Busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their what? Own bread. bread. But it's so hard and I can't do it. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. You got to keep trying. You got to keep trying. Well, uh, no matter, uh, there are statistics that show no matter how much you try to help out a person that they won't be able to make ends meet. Okay, I acknowledge that because you're relying on the current system. You have to rely on God. When you rely on God, there have been poor people and many people. Look, I uh, believe it or not, I was a poor person myself when I was pastoring a church at the beginning. In fact, as a matter of fact, I was suffering so much poverty that I was actually going by scholarships or financial aid. That's how poor I was. They gave me financial aid because they recognized my income, my low income. Now the Lord has blessed me and taken care of me, but you see, I had to trust in him and have him provide for me. There were people in this church who knew me for years. And then uh, we were all, how do we pay the church rent, the bills? I had all the odds stacked up against me. If you don't think so, you start a church in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley from scratch. Once Facebook came in, not years prior, but once Facebook and those Silicon Giants came in. Let's see how well you do. I went through immeasurable pain. You have no idea what you're talking about. I went through immigration issues and all this kind of stuff. You have no idea what you're talking about. You don't know the pain that I went through. And I can tell you one thing is that I know for a fact that God, I had to trust in him despite of the odds and he took care of me. Okay. And he'll do the same thing with you. You just have to trust him. You just have to trust him because what I got the handout from the government wouldn't keep me going. You know what kept me going? Somebody's voluntary action without me even asking who gave. Why? Because the Lord laid it upon that person's heart. You know that? Amen. Oh, by the way, I would like to say this. Do you know how I'm surviving right now? I know that there's a certain level that I get payment, but you know how I'm really surviving right now with what I have? It's all you guys not being forced or being fine to give me. Everyone doing their part. Praise the Lord. Okay? So just trust the Lord and that, uh, you know, how he took care of me, he'll do the same thing with you. But you have to trust in him, not in yourself. In uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're going to go over there, 1 Timothy chapter 6. And then we'll call it a night, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we'll read verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And we'll read verse 17. The Bible says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in what? Uncertain Uncertain riches. That's what you're trusting in. Are you trusting in this? You got your focus on the wrong thing. That's why you're not going to make ends meet. Yes, no matter how much a handout you get, you won't last. You trust in what? The living God. Yes. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. God's going to provide and give to you. That's who you should trust. But the Bible says don't seek help by trusting in what? Princes. The Bible says trust in the living God. I wonder where your trust is in. See, be truly honest. Did you really trust it in this system truly, how you're living right now? Or are you trusting in, right? All right, I hope that people will make the right decision, that basically God is the one that we should trust more and that uh, the current princes or rulers that we have today, our leaders, that the Bible says do not, do not, do not trust. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been very helpful, eye-opening, and people are able to have an answer now on why the current system is wrong and how they can witness and show their other friends out there why it's wrong. I pray that this was done in a persuasive manner, eye-opening manner that will help out people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.